All right, fellas. It's just Hal and I today. Uh, yeah. You know the name. I've talked about him many times. Um, you know, Hal wrote a book. He got, you know, he got a lot of attention around the world for this morning routine, you know, the miracle morning. Uh, but many of you know, have been listening to the show that Hal is also a very close friend. And uh, because we have this event coming up in December, which Hal will be there and speaking December 6th through the 8th uh, in Austin, you know, I just said, hey man, let's get on the phone and just, or let's get, let's get on Zoom and just have a conversation. So those people who don't know you can get to know you and those who already know you might learn something else. But either way, we'll start building momentum to this big event where we're all, all going to get together in person. So guys, how first and foremost, uh, one of the most passionate people I know, you know, one of the most excited uh, when he finds something that he enjoys, he loves to share it with anybody and everybody. And it just so happened that the thing he found in the miracle morning, which he used for himself, ended up helping thousands and thousands uh, of people around the world. You know, the book is published in who knows how many languages at this point. Last I heard it was in the 30s. Maybe it's more than than that. It sold millions of copies. There's a movie about it. There's a brand new book that just got released. There's an app, which is amazing. We just launched the Miracle Morning Challenge in the Front Row Dad community. And there's just so much that I could say about all that. And every and, and there's so many people that know how. I can't tell you, by the way, as a friend and kind of being there from the beginning, it was cool to be like out at a restaurant with Hal and somebody like recognize him. You know, and and spot him and be like, dude, are you Hal Elrod? And I was like, whoa, dude, this is like, this is amazing. Or I remember one time we were talking with somebody and they were talking about the fact that they were in a book club and they were reading a really cool book called The Miracle Morning. And they were telling Hal and I that we should read The Miracle <laughs> Morning. And that was also a fun one. That happened at True Foods Kitchen, Hal. Do you, I yeah, don't even I remember, remember that. that. True yeah. Foods Kitchen. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, yeah, would you ever Would you ever want to meet the author? Because <laughs> he's right here. There that is just, so funny. I forgot about that. There is so many great moments over, over the years. But why we wanted to have this conversation today was that I said, Hal, I don't know that we've ever really explored how you built your life going back like to how you were making money prior to being married to his beautiful wife, Ursula, how's the father of two amazing children. But like back, back, back in the day, there's like almost a how, how built this. Because I think people are amazed when they look on the wall behind him and they see, you know, book title after book title after book title, and they see the final product. But dude, let's, you know, we're going to take a a, you know, a walk down memory lane, if you will, and talk about the decisions that Hal made in his life along the way to ultimately create what now is a lot of freedom for himself, a lot of time freedom, a lot of financial freedom. And he's got this empire, you know, that's that's fueling this incredible life that he has with his family. And, and that looks attractive, but there's a lot of that, there's a lot that went into it. So we're going to go back through and kind of chapter by chapter, pun intended. Uh -huh. We're going to go back through and look at this whole thing. So buddy, it's great to spend the morning with you. Uh, Any time with you is good time. I got the afternoon with you. I got the morning with you yesterday, the afternoon with you yesterday. I got the morning again with you. Jeez, this is a lot of John Hal time, man. Yeah, this is a lot, a lot of time. And yet still, I think what I love about our friendship is even though we're doing this, we're not just, um, we're not just going through the motions. Mm. Like I called you from the gym this morning and I'm like, dude, what would be a re really fun conversation for us to have? What's a what's yeah. something that I've never really explored with you? Or even if I have, I've forgotten because yeah. so many years have gone past. So let's dig in, dude. Let's go back and let's start. I don't even know if I know the answer to this, man. I could take some guesses. But pre-Ursula, when yeah. you were getting engaged, which would have been what year-ish? Uh 2009. Okay. So around, around late 2000s, what are you doing at that point to make money when you, when you're with Ursula and you're deciding to start a family and get engaged? What, what, how are you making yeah. money? So I met Ursula in 2004 and uh, I was selling Cutco at the time. And uh, 2005 was my last year selling Cutco. 
And then I asked myself a question that, you know, we can all ask ourselves, how can I best serve? Right. And I, I think, it, I think it was much more, it was much less altruistic. It was, how can I best make money? Like, I was like, what, what am I qualified to do? And, um, I had hired a coach that year and I, the coach really changed my life. And I was like, wow, I feel like I would love to do this for people. And then I asked myself who am I qualified to coach? And I was like, well, all I've really done up until this point is I've sold a lot of Cutco kitchen cutlery. I thought, why don't I start there and reach out to my colleagues, uh, who know who I am and, you know, they've seen me on the sales reports and, and offer to coach them. And I think I started like $200 a month for the first five clients and then went to 300 and then 500 and 600 and, you know, on and on and on. But when Ursula and I got engaged, um, I was coaching. And so I was coaching mostly Cutco people, but then I had joined a networking group, Business Networking International in my local town of Sacramento. And uh, the financial advisor, the president of that said, hey, I'm looking for a coach. Would you coach me? And um, and I it's funny. That's actually, he was actually my first client now that I think about it. And you guys listen to this is a good, there's a lesson here. I was like, of course. Yeah, no. He goes, yeah. So you're a coach. I'm like, yeah, totally. I, I don't think I had a client yet. And, uh, and I was like, yeah. And he goes, well, I'd love to coach with you, you know? And I'm like, okay, let's schedule a call for next week. Cause I knew it would take two days shipping to Amazon to send me a book on life coaching. So I knew what the hell it was in a way that I could explain to him and sell him on hiring me. So I literally two days, you know, I got in the car. I remember I can see myself in front of the BNI ordering that book, right? The life coaching handbook is what it was called. And so I really could understand coaching more because I had been coached, but I didn't know what my guy was doing behind the scenes. It was coaching me. So anyway, so that's how I started. So I was, I was making money as a one-on-one -on -one coach and um, I had grown it to about an $80,000 a year business in the first year or probably two years. Um, yeah, that's how I started when I met Ursula. And, you know, I think so many times you hear the story about somebody that feels called to do something, right? You felt called to coach. You had been coached. You loved it. You thought, Hey, could I, could I do the same? Could I help other people? Uh, you say yes to the opportunity, the opportunity presents itself yeah, to you. Yeah. And then you're like, let me figure this out, uh, on the go. Yeah. And, and do you, do you can you see that? I mean, has that been kind of your pattern over the years? Even if I just fast forward very quickly through totally. the years, this idea of like make a decision and then figure it out along the way. A hundred percent. In fact, I find that's my favorite form of accountability is I just commit publicly to something or commit in some way. Um, even like when I ran the ultra marathon for front row foundation, um, I, I, I hated running and I knew that I would procrastinate, you know, that like, if I didn't tell everybody, that I was going to do it, that I would not probably not do it because I didn't like to run. So I just made an announcement. Hey guys, I'm raising money for this charity uh, that my buddy, John Vroman founded, and uh, I'm going to run this marathon, you know? And I thought, you know, I like, I will look like a real jerk now if I like make this announcement and then all of a sudden, you know, months go by and like, how's that, that training going for that charity you're committed to raising money for? And I'm like, uh, uh, so I was like, that's my accountability. So yeah. Um, I announced great. Another example, I announced the pub date of the miracle morning book because it was December 12th, 2012, 12, 12, 12. I thought, what a cool date, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I, I don't know the math, but I don't think it comes along very often. Right. So I thought what a cool date. And, uh, and so I announced to everybody in my audience and I didn't have an audience really, but I had a little, like I was building one, which we can talk about. I was building an audience. Um, and, but I was unknown. I, I wasn't a known any, you know, other than Cutco, no one knew who I was. I didn't have a, a, a public persona. Um, but I committed on social media to all my friends and followers and family. This is the pub date. And then I was committed and I had to work into that. Right. Whereas most people are like, once I finish my book, then I'll announce it. And I'm like, mm. nope, I like to announce things. And then I have a public form of accountability. And then, yeah, and so that's interesting that you frame it that way that I realized, yeah, that I guess that's how I've done most, most things. So in, in 2009 ish is when you really started making money as a, as a coach. That was 2009. No, 2006. You, 2006. When I started. Sorry. Yeah. So I left Cutco after 2005, 2006. Um, and then 2008 was when I started with the miracle morning, right. Uh, practicing it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and then once I started sharing it, I just shared it with my coaching clients and then almost all of them were like, like most people, I'm not a morning person, Hal. I'm like, I know, but you pay me to challenge you to get out of your comfort zone. And I wasn't a morning person either. And then I gave them like the tips I used to beat the snooze button. Like I move my alarm clock across the room in my bathroom so that I can't reach over on my bedside table and hit snooze. I have to get out of bed and walk across the room. And what I realized is it's, three, four, five, 10 times easier to stay awake 
when you're out of bed upright and walking than it is when you're reaching your arm to the bedside table. So I taught all these little, little strategies to them. No, no, here's how you beat the snooze button. Um, and, uh, they ended up, uh, 13 out of 14 of my coaching clients came back to their next call and were like, Oh my gosh, this miracle morning thing, it works. Like I'm waking up every day. I'm getting, and that's when the light bulb went off and I went, well, wait a minute. If the miracle morning changed my life and I wasn't a morning person and it changed my clients' lives and they weren't morning people, this could work for anybody. And right. I have a responsibility to share this with as many people as I possibly can. You know, so when I look at so much of your world over the last number of years, let's call it back to 2006, um, it feels like the theme is momentum. You're mm -hmm. like, you're, you have a speed of implementation. Mm -hmm. Like we, we were even, when we were, it was trick or treating with the kids a couple of nights ago. And I talked to you about somebody coming <laughs> to Front Row Dad yeah. Live. Yeah. And you're like, I'm gonna text him right now. And we're yeah. like standing in line and you're texting this person. Your speed of implementation is, I think, one of your greatest assets. You you have an idea, you have, you want to take action on something, and you just move courageously towards that thing and then figure yeah. it out along the way. Courageously it feels like or thoughtlessly. It's it's one well, probably a little <laughs> bit of both. Yeah. Well, you know, it's still momentum. Sure. However, it still creates something for you. It, sure. And overthinking, you think about it, overthinking can kill courage, right? Yeah. Because you, 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 you get in your head and you're like, oh, but what if, what if, what if versus just do it and figure it out. You know, it's, it's, it's the whole, you know, jump and build your wings on the way down. Right. Right. Philosophy. Yeah. So um, two, 2008, Miracle Morning, when did speaking enter the the fold or were there other ways that you were making money other than being a coach? So that was, yeah, that was my dream was to be a professional speaker. And um, in 2005 or six, when I, when I joined that networking group, um, they, uh, they, they want somebody, they said, Hey, country our you know, our friends at Countrywide here in Sacramento, Countrywide Home Loans, which was the biggest home loan company back then they're looking for a, a speaker, you know, what do you like, would you speak? What do you charge? I'm like, uh, $500. <laughs> I'm like, and I was like scared. That was too much. They're like, Oh, that's a great, I think they'll do go for that. So they booked me for 500 bucks. Um, so that was my first paid gig. Um, but then I really, again, I asked myself who am I qualified to talk to? Um, and it was, it was now salespeople for sure. Right. That was my background. I was a hall of fame sales rep for Cutco, but it was like, I'm young and I look younger than I even am. You know, at the time I was what, 25 or so, um, and, uh, 26. And so I thought I'm probably best qualified. And my nickname is yo pal, Hal, right. I'm like, I think I'm best qualified to talk to like high schools and colleges. And so that's where I started high schools and colleges. And it was like 500. And then I earned a thousand. Here's a little, here's a little strategy in terms of fees, whether you're a, a coach or any kind of service business. Every time I got someone to agree to a fee, I, I either doubled it or increased it by a significant amount. I went, okay, that, that, that validates I'm worth 500, which means I bet I could ask somebody for a thousand and get it. And my next speech and speaking engagement, I asked for a thousand dollars and I got it. The next one I asked for 1500 and I got it. And then I went to two and then three and then, you know, and so on and so forth. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll fast forward a little bit and then we'll come back. But when I wrote the miracle morning, um, you know, cause I had kind of capped out in college and you and I started speaking at colleges together and you actually, you, you, you rose, like you, you surpassed me in terms of the amount of gigs you were getting um, the, uh, the, the fees you were getting. Um, so I was really looking up to you in that regard. And I really wanted to be like, my dream was to be a $10,000 corporate speaker. Like that was kind of the magic fee, like $10,000 for a, you know, one hour keynote. And, um, and so I used the miracle morning when I was writing that book, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to tell stories in here of the companies I've spoken for. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to lie at all, but I'm going to make, you know, just make it sound like, oh, this guy's like a legit corporate keynote speaker. Right. Which I, I don't know if I was, I don't think I was definitely didn't feel that way. Um, but every speech I've gotten for the last 11 years, almost every, maybe every speech, um, I've never done any marketing, every speech I've gotten. And I speak a lot, um, is, uh, is from people that read the original miracle morning book. Right. And I've planted the seed multiple times that I speak on this topic. And then, you know, it's an executive, it's a CEO, it's a VP. And then they reach out through miraclemorning.com or halelrod.com. Um, and they go, Hey, I read Hal's book. This is amazing. Our people need this message. 
can he come speak? You know, and I was able, and I raised my fee from 10 to 12, five to 15 to 20 to 25. And then now it's at 30. Um, and I never, so that's like, that's 300% more than I ever could even fathom that I could earn as a keynote speaker. Um, but it all started at $500. Uh, right. And then, and then it, it, it escalated when I decided to use the Miracle Morning book as kind of a marketing tool, you know, and I didn't know if it would work, right? I mean, a lot of this is just, you know, throwing darts and seeing what what lands. You know, <clears throat> again, I'm going to try to pick apart the threads that I see. And yeah. I'm also looking at it, not just from this interview, but of course, having seen the whole journey from yeah. then until now. But one thing I'll say is that when you talk about, you know, I added these things to the book and I wanted people to see me a certain way. What I what I know existed for you was that you saw it first, mm -hmm. like you saw it in your mind. And that's mm -hmm. all. I mean, that's part of the Miracle Morning routine. But you have this ability to visualize and to believe in yourself before other people pay you for that, because you have to have the courage to say, I'm worth this in order yeah. for somebody to even be able to make the decision. Do they want to pay you that? for coaching or for speaking, but yeah. you kept believing in yourself and you kept seeing the value of what you would do. And you keep, you kept rolling the dice and, 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 and putting out a higher fee and people would say yes to it. I, I, same thing happened to me when I hired Michael and Amy Port to help coach me. And I remember that we were doing some speaker training and Michael had said to me, John, you're one of the best speakers I've ever, I mean, like I'm, I'm on the circuit. Like I know the speaker yeah. You're one of the best, the only thing standing in the way of you being a, you know, $7,500 speaker and a $15,000 speaker is literally you're quoting the wrong price, totally. you know, and if you yeah. quote 15, you're going to get it because you're that good. And yeah. all he had to do was say that. Yeah. And the next quote that went out was 15 and I got it. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, you know, I think what's so great about those types of lessons when we unpack them is we also remember as dads, mm. the importance of being able to see potential in our kids to totally. encourage them to see potential in themselves and that so much of growth is that um, we need to be able to ask for what we believe that we're worth and i think that needs to come from a true place i don't i think that if you just go i'm worth seven hundred thousand dollars a yeah, speech yeah. i think you might you might be up against a challenge yeah. well but that's I think, why yeah oh I was gonna say, that's why i like the ratchet approach that i always use right yeah. You know, and I did the same thing with coaching. Like I said, I started at 200 a month and then 300 and then four, you know, and then, right. I just, it's that ratchet approach and it's a lot easier. I think, uh, not only is it easy, but it feels a lot more authentic where you're like, okay, if I've been paid a thousand dollars to do this, right. Then 1500 is not that far of a stretch. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, whereas it would feel inauthentic for you to be like, how, how, how do I know I'm worth 15 if I've only been paid 1500? Right. Like I'm not going to 10 exit on the, you know, you know, and all, and although I'm sure there's some stories of people that have done that and gone from, you know, zero to 60 a lot faster, but you know, you were going to say something or ask something. Well, let me go back here. So you were doing individual coaching and you started speaking. Um, and when, when did you get, do you remember what year it was that you got your first like $10,000 speech? How far well, into your speaking journey so there's, was that? There's a piece, there's a piece to the story in between that. Um, which is a really important one. And it, uh, you know, cause my income was, it was, you know, it was, I don't know, seven or eight grand a month, uh, you know, without when I was doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, let's say I probably had $500, you know, per, per client. And let's say, is it, yeah, 20 clients is 20 grand. I, I don't remember. I'm doing the bad math, but here's the point. I was earning a, a decent income, but not like feeling super financially secure, right? Kind of just enough to pay the bills. Um, and then, uh, and it happened organically, but, um, I had, I had read this book called multiple streams of coaching income and, um, and I had learned about group coaching. And so that seed was planted for me. Like, Ooh, I, one day I want to do group coaching. Cause the idea was instead of trading time for money, one for one, right. One client, 500 bucks a month. Um, what if you had 50 people on a call, right. And they're all paying, you know, a hundred dollars a month, well, that's $5,000 a month for that same one hour call. And so that seed was planted and I ended up having um, five uh, managers in Cutco that were like, hey, we really want to coach with you, but we can't afford $500 a month each. Would you let all five of us get on a call once a month with you? And then we each pay a hundred bucks and it's your, it's your fee. And then we'll connect ahead of time and figure out how we're going to, what we need from you. And I was like, sure. 
And, uh, and so I did that. And then one of them was like, Hey, this is so good. We have another manager that wants to join. And that's where the multiple streams of coaching income book. And then these five people and then getting a referral all converge. And I went, they go, yeah, can he join for another hundred dollars a month? I'm like, Oh yes. And then I, I, and then I sent out an email to those five people and I was like, Hey, uh, Derek referred so-and-so, um, and we're adding him to the group, same price, hundred bucks a month. Um, but I wanted to open this up to all of you. I'm sure, you know, other managers that could use coaching and we can add them to the group and I'll give you 10% off of your coaching. So theoretically, if you were to get 10 managers that wanted the coaching, um, you'd have your coaching free. Um, and so, uh, I got 70 referrals, I think, um, or, or something along those lines and, or no, it was within two months. I had 70 new coaching members. So they sent me all these referrals. And then I just started developing a system where I would sign a new person on. Um, and then I would send an email to them that asked, it was just a template that I copied and pasted to each person. Um, and, uh, and, and also I copied and pasted the text to each person like, Hey, your friend referred to you, blah, 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 blah. Let's jump on a quick 15 minute call. And I just copied and pasted that to, you know, 20 referrals a day. And then I would get on calls that week. They'd take like 15, 20 minutes. I would close them, um, or sign them up. And then, um, yeah. And, and I went from, it was amazing. So within two months I had 70 people paying a hundred dollars a month but I wasn't running extra calls. I was running two calls a month for those 70 people. So now I'm at $7,000 a month for those two calls that I used to get $500 a month because there was only one person paying me and that was a real eye opener. And then that program, eventually I scaled it to 220 people at $100 a month. That's $22,000 a month. And I'm still doing those two one hour phone calls that I would be doing for 500 bucks a month. And what year is that? That the that coaching was 2011, program. I believe, is when I, I made that leap. Okay. So just for context here, um, where does uh, where does Sophia enter the picture? Yeah, so Sophia was born at the end of 2009. Um, and uh, so I, so we had Sophia. And then um, the... So talk uh, about that. Talk about that for a minute, by the way. Like, mm. Sophia enters the world. You're yeah. a beautiful girl. And, um, and what's happening for you at that time? Like, talk to us about how hard are you working? What are you working on? You know, are you working six days a week, seven days a week? You know, yeah. what is, what does Hal's life look like as a new dad? It's an important piece. So, um, so Sophie, obviously we got pregnant with her in 2008, right? It, actually, we actually, we got engaged in 2008 and we got pregnant like a month after we got engaged. And we actually moved the wedding up because of that. The wedding was planned for like August, 2009. We're like, ah, we're gonna go to March, 2009. Um, but before Sophie was born, uh, I was um, just rebounding from the financial crisis that I had, right? So Miracle Morning comes about in my mind in 2008 and I start practicing it. So I get, pre we get pregnant with Sophia, like right when I'm in the beginning of practicing miracle morning. And although I had doubled my income in the first two months of practicing miracle morning, I, my house was already foreclosed on. So I was already, I was, we were about to move out and have to move back in with my dad. Um, I was $52,000 in personal credit card debt from the last six months. So I was not in a great place financially. And, you know, and again, and I had bought my first house. Now we lost it. I'm back with my dad. So we're going like, you know, I'm like, and then we find out we're pregnant, uh, you know, and we're like, uh, I, um, I, uh, I, I wasn't, we weren't expecting that. So it was a really like, we're like, oh, this wasn't, I don't know what to do. And, uh, and I was working seven days a week, you know, for sure. And so, um, the, uh, so when Sophia was born though, I, I was so all in, I mean, so I, you know, we would do shifts and I would bounce her, you know, in the, in the middle of the night, all night, um, with, uh, with Ursula, we would take turns. And so, yeah, man, so I, I was all in and then Ursula, um, actually was still working and going to college. And so during the day I would actually take care of, I would schedule my coaching calls around taking care of Sophia while Sophie or Ursula went to work or went to school. So yeah, so it was, a, it was definitely, a, you know, a hectic, wasn't financially free, wasn't time free, I, you know, but I had flexibility in my schedule because I, I set my coaching calls. And when did, um, when did the book really take off? When did you start seeing significant income? What year was mm -hmm. that, that the book started providing? Yeah, so I started writing the book in uh, early 2009 before Sophia was born. She was born in August um, and I published the book 12, 12, 2012. 
Um, and uh, my goal was to sell a million copies the first year. Um, and it's a, kind of a pipe dream. It was just like, well, why not? You know, change one million lives one morning at a time. That was my mantra. That was my my uh, my affirmation. My 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 vision. My commitment. My mission. And uh, and uh, I did everything in my power that year to sell a million books. Like everything I knew how. I literally I worked. You know, I worked a ton. Um, I was on social media every day. I launched a podcast so I could nurture the email list that I was building because in the Miracle Morning book, um, I, I learned this from some you know author that, hey, put in, you know, give your bonuses away in exchange for an email address so that you can start communicating with your readers and your fans. And then when you ever have something else that you want to offer to them, right? Well, now you at least have that email list. And I was, it was Dan Kennedy. It said, the most valuable asset you'll have in today's world is an email list that you can nurture, have a relationship with, market to, et cetera. So, um, I, I did, uh, I did, I was on over 152 podcasts that year. Um, so I, I solicited, and again, I was unknown, right? It's not like people knew who I was or knew who Miracle Morning was. I just emailed podcasters, begged to be on their show, got on 150 shows. And at the end of the year, when I did everything in my power to sell a million books, uh, I ended the year at 13,000 copies sold. And, um, the, uh, you know, I was 987,000 copies short of my goal, right? So if you're doing a little math, that's a 98.7% <laughs> failure rate. That'd be like, if your goal was to earn a hundred grand for the year and you earned $1,300 to put it in perspective. Right. Um, and I was discouraged. I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? But I, I, I was paying attention to the emails I was getting from people saying this book changed my life. It saved my marriage. It got yeah. me off my depression medication, which on, to this day, I get those emails regularly. Like this got me off my depression meds. I had somebody the other day apply to be part of the miracle morning messenger book launch team. And they're like, my, my, you know, miracle morning. I used to suffer from anxiety and depression. And now they're there. I've, I've gotten a hold of them and my doctors cut my meds in half. I mean, I like from the miracle morning. So the point of all that is it was, I was so like, the, every email I got, every review on the book, I said, I have a responsibility to share this with every human being on the planet that I possibly can. It is wrong of me not to do so. It is selfish of me not to do so. This isn't even about me anymore, right? It's not even about, and that became my mm -hmm. mantra. It's not about me. Whenever I felt tired or scared or whatever, it's not about me. That was my mantra. It's not about me. That's how I overcame fear. I did the thing I was afraid of because it's not about me. Hal, you're afraid right now. But the person that needs this book, that needs your service, that needs, they're not, your fear has nothing to do with them. Get over it, dude. It's not about you. And so I was like, all right, I, you know, I, I definitely didn't hit the million mark, but I'm just going to commit for as long as it takes. And I remember in my mind, I don't know why, but I remember 30. I'm like, maybe it'll take me 30 years. I'll be in my 60s. You know, cool. Well, that's a great, and then I'll retire. That's a life well lived, right? I, I changed a million lives. Um, and I just kept going and it took six years. So uh, six years later, uh, I had sold a million copies of the miracle morning. And in terms of it started to generate significant income, it was 18 months in. So 18 months in is when it, it hockey sticked. It went from like 2000 copies a month, um, which was actually like $14,000 a month. I was making about $7 a copy. So that was, I mean, that was great income, but then it, 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 I got on Pat Flynn's podcast and Pat Flynn was like, I'm a night owl, Hal. I don't want to be a morning person like convince me. I'm like, okay, damn. And, uh, and he tells me that he wakes up every morning when his kids come in and go, daddy, daddy, daddy. And I'm like, how the hell am I going to convince him that I've got a better way to wake up, dude? Yeah, yeah. You should set your alarm clock for an hour before that happens. Right. I'm like, I got, you know, but anyway, he ends up convinced by the end of our podcast, like Hal, I think you're right. I think I'm missing out as productive as I am. He said, I think I'm missing. I may be missing out on a level of productivity that I'm not even aware of by not starting my day in an optimal way before the kids wake up, hmm. I'm going to commit for 30 days. And he committed and he shared it with his, like on his social media and you know, that he was doing this 30 day miracle morning challenge. And our, our book sales went from 2000 a month to 5,000 a month. Wow. And, 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 and they stayed there for like seven years or something. And then um, eventually dropped a bit, but, um, but yeah. And so, so that was my income was like, it was wild. It was, it was, and it was a self-published book. So I was, you know, uh, no money went to the publisher. It went a little bit to Amazon and most to me as the author. Okay. Go, what year again was that, that the book kind of popped in? 2004, 2014. Yeah. 2014. So June, 2014. So a year and a half after the 12, 12, 12 pub date. So June, oh, 2014 is when it really took off. So, you know, I think what's, what's, what I'm trying to 
appreciate here, and I think everybody's appreciating this, is like you you also didn't have a lot of balance. I mean, you were working, right? It sounds like you were working really hard, 150 podcast episodes. You were on a mission. Yeah. Um, I think that's a normal part of the story of like when you're building something, you probably are working really hard in the beginning, but you're also learning to leverage yourself. Yeah. These different, you know, you go from individual coaching to group coaching. You're going from, uh, you know, talking to people about the Miracle Morning to putting it in a book and then getting it out to the world, something that scales, something that has leverage to it. Um, you start to get some financial freedom. What's happening at that point with your family? Let's talk about like, if I went back and we talked to Ursula or you look at your life as a father, what does that look like during this time, even when it's popping? 2014, yeah. you start making a lot of money. How's Ursula feeling? How are the how are you feeling as a dad? Yeah. Um, so my other son, I should say, uh, not my other son, my one son, Halston was born in 2012, right before the book came out. So September 2012, Halston was born. Two months later, the book comes out. Now I will say, um, my wife totally stepped up and um she allowed me uh to with Sophia, we traded off in the middle of the night with who would take care of her and rock her back to sleep. When Halston was born, uh, Ursula took a hundred percent of the brunt of that. And she went, look like, you know, and I think we started talking. I'm like, I like the, you know, the miracle morning is crucial for me. Like right now I'm in this phase where, you know, I've got to launch this book I'm doing, you know, and it, and it was the, the, the old, I'm doing it for the family, which I mean, you know, obviously I'm doing it for me too, but in a lot of ways, I mean, this was, I was trying to really take our family's financial security to another level. Um, and, uh, and she had seen how hard I worked to write the book and, you know, I mean, th three, three years to write the book. And so she said, I'll stay up with Halston, you know, cause I go, you can sleep during the day. Like I can't, I've got to do my coaching calls. So like I need to be on. And she totally was agreeable and supportive. And she was like, I'll, I'll take care of Halston in the, you know, all night long. And, uh, and then I can sleep when he naps during the day. And so that was huge. Um, but I will say that for quite a few years, I was a, I was a workaholic. I was a very engaged dad, you know, reading the kids, store, waking them up in the morning, putting them in bed at night. Um, but a lot of weekends, um, I would, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd work, uh, I would miss camping trips. Um, you know, looking back now, like seeing pictures of Ursula and the kids camping without me there, I just, it breaks my heart. I'm like, dude, you know, ugh, like, uh, kills me that I wasn't there for that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it wasn't until I got cancer. And we don't, you know, we go into that or not, but 2017, so right, five years after the book published, or 2016, four years after the book published, um, that uh, that that cancer journey is what woke me up to, oh, I say family's number one, but my schedule does not reflect that. Like the way I spend my time does not reflect that. The way I prioritize work over them too often does not reflect that. Yeah, I I wonder. Oh, there's a couple things I want to unpack here. Um, where do I want to go first? Okay, let me just talk real quick about the expansion of the book too, because you write the book, it's doing well. Mm -hmm. um, when does the series begin? I think the first one was salespeople, right? Sales with people. uh, yeah. with snow. Ryan snow. Yeah, my buddy Ryan reaches out literally like maybe six months after the book published, our friend Ryan Snow. And he says, Hal, um, I've given the Miracle Morning to all my salespeople and uh, about half of them have read it. And the half that read it, all of them how their sales have increased and the half that didn't read it no difference he's like so i am noticing the correlation have you thought about doing like a miracle morning spinoff or series like miracle morning for salespeople and this is me, my mo i'm like dude let's co-author it <laughs> like, yep probably the first words out of my mouth right yep you know, um, right. And, 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 and a smart business person would probably be like, I mean, they, a lot of things they would have done differently, but they want one is they would be like, who's the best person to co-author this book? Not the first person that brings yeah. up the idea. Um, but, uh, but so yeah, so Ryan, I co-authored that. And then I met Honoré Quarter, um, like serendipitously. And, uh, I, uh, I hired her to help me create the series because she had created a successful single mom's book series. And so, um, and I found her series and, and, uh, and she had created left a comment on Goodreads that Miracle Morning changed your life. And I'm like, wait a minute, it changed your life. And you wrote a book series. Maybe I could hire you to help me uh, figure out how to create a book series. Right. And so Honoré, if you look at every, almost every book or every book, I think says with Honoré quarter at the bottom, because she helped me uh, create all these books. It, it's another thing that I want to pick apart or pick out of the story for a moment and highlight it is your partnerships and your sharing. 
while in hindsight, if you had a business consultant look at your how you structured things over the years, they might say, oh, you could have done a little differently on that. You know, I think you gave away a little too much of a percentage. You, <laughs> totally. you could have picked a different partner there, whatever it would be. But the point is, you partnered with people. You, this was this was not where you are today is not just because you worked harder and harder and harder, but you partnered with people. Yeah. Even when you created the Miracle Morning movie, it's it, every part of it was like, let me bring other people in to help tell the story, to get the word out. And I think it's it's been really cool to watch you do that. And even though some people would have criticized like, oh man, you messed this up. You did that. You still got the word out yeah. um, and you took care of people. Other people have become millionaires because of the Miracle Morning as well, which yeah. is cool. Um, so I just wanted to, I wanted to mention that. Well, and also, I'll mention, so a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one is, yeah, leveraging, you know, it's, it's almost like licensing, right? Kind of licensing the brand where like John Berghoff, our friend, uh, you know, we, he was at my house one day, I was told him I was putting on a live event and he was like, how are you going to do it? I'm like, I have no idea, dude. I've never done this before. And he was like, he had been doing these live events for, for Vitamix. And so he's like, I can help you. Right. And then we ended up being partners on it. And then Honore, same thing, right. She, she helped me, you know, I was like, Hey, let's do the book series. And then uh, she did a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, like the back end work of like what needed to get done. I just, you know, I, I would leverage my relationships and bring in a co-author like a Cameron Harold or a Joe Polish or, you know, different people that co-authored. And then I want to say this, uh, an important lesson. Um, I learned this from Evan Pagan. He said, uh, most people are very greedy in business and they want to get the most they can out of every deal. He said, I've learned to love getting the short end of the stick. And he mm. said, and in doing so, people want to do business with me and they like doing business with me. And he said, everybody wants to give me their stick. Mm. And so um, that really resonated with my values. You know, for me, I, 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 and I don't always do this, you know, unintentionally, but I, I always want to give more than I take. Right. And whenever I'm get, and that's why actually I struggle to ask for help because of that. Cause I'm like, Oh man, I've already asked you for help. I don't want to ask you again, or I don't, I haven't helped you in a while. And, you know, so there's a lot of, I have a lot of, you know, trauma or whatever around that. But, but the point being, um, uh, just being generous. And like, so what I did with the Miracle Morning book series is I, I reached out to some chicken soup for the soul co-authors that I knew. And I said, Hey, what did you like about that process? And what didn't you like? And the feedback that they didn't love is that what they loved is, you know, they're chicken soup for the soul author. Now big deal. They didn't love that. They, um, uh, they, I think that, you know, they got like a few percentages points on each book, right? It was very minimal. And, um, and I was like, oh, I don't ever want someone to say like, oh yeah, being a co-author was cool, but I didn't make any money. So I decided that my co-authors would make more money than I would. In fact, they made double what I did on every book that we did. Um, and, uh, the, and that's where I've taken a lot of criticism. Like <laughs> any of my friends in business are like, dude, that's stupid. Like, this is your brand. You've built this. You've like, they should be getting a small percentage to tag onto your brand. But you know, um, yeah, so it is what it is. And I, uh, I have, I guess I have mixed feelings in hindsight, right? How I might've done it differently, but, um, but, uh, but overall, uh, I would say they, they had a good experience. So, yeah, I, I think the road to get to where you are, is, it's never going to be a perfect, you know, no, when course. you, when you look back on it, but the fact that you're still here, I mean, that's the reason we're talking is like, you've, you've now landed in a place where many people are like, how do I get there? Yeah. Where Hal has financial freedom and he has time freedom and, and you are totally engaged with your kids. And I, you know, I see it. I love watching it. Your life is in a very healthy place right now, which is great. It's not perfect either, because again, we, we, I know that there's challenges that you face currently. Um, let's talk a little bit about the the 20, you know, 16, 17 ish yeah. era. Yeah. I had just moved from Jersey to Austin. Um, you know, I land in the area here and you be, are, I started journey to Austin. You're beginning a journey to basically fight, to fight for your life. Yeah. And this is a turning point for you. I know this is a turning point for you. Um, it's documented in the miracle morning movie, this part of your life, but Talk to me about this and and maybe talk to me through the lens of like, you've got some money now. You've yeah. got some recurring income, right? Yeah. And yeah. you're about to fight one of the hardest battles of your life, if not the hardest battle. Yeah. And it screwed up our plans to hang out a lot 
when you first moved <laughs> yes. here. It really messed up our plans, dude. I have a lot of resentment for you. Yeah, oh, I, therapy. I, I would too. Um, no, so yeah, so 2016, October, um, I I, uh, I go to the, I, I wake up struggling to breathe and uh, I go to the ER and they misdiagnose me with pneumonia. Um, uh, they said, uh, and they, they, uh, they drained my lung of like a liter and a half of fluid. And then they said, Hey, if you're not better, get a second opinion. Cause we're not sure about it. And then like a day and a half later, I can't breathe again. And I go into the ER and I get my lung drained. And then it happens again, every other day for like 11 days, something like that, maybe seven days, whatever I'm going to get my lung drained. And so I ended up being diagnosed with a very rare aggressive form of cancer, acute lymphoblastic leukemia which, um, you know, it, it has a 20 to 30% survival rate. So it, it, it just, it shuts down your organs. So when I went into the cancer hospital, MD Anderson in, in uh, Houston, they figured out that not only was my lung collapsing, my heart was on the verge of failing. And so were my kidneys. And, uh, and so again, my organs were shutting down and the doctor said, Hal, if you don't start chemo today, uh, you you're going to be dead in the next one to three weeks. And, Ugh, my daughter or my uh, wife is, you know, sitting there holding my hand, squeezing it, you know, t t almost off. And, uh, and I, I you know, I, I was, I, I, I know about scare tactics, right. In terms of like, you know, Hey, you need to do the thing or right. Like, so I was like, I just didn't trust it. I was like, like, let me do my own research. And I went home and he said, well, I would at least, you know, decide by tomorrow. And I went home and I Googled, uh, my cancer. And it turned out, you know, like, no, that's the survival rate. And then I Googled who are the best holistic oncologists in the country. And I called a couple of them. One of them, Dr. Brzezinski is famous and he lives in Houston. So where I was at the hospital and he's Polish, which my wife totally thought was a sign. She's Polish. So, and I really was like, oh my God, this is it. He lives here. This is it. I'm going to call him. He's going to give me a natural cure because I don't want to poison myself. The chemo regimen was 650 hours of chemotherapy over a seven month period. So about a hundred hours a month. Whereas a lot of cancer, you'll get like a one hour infusion once a week. You know, we were talking a hundred hours a month and I was, I did not want my body through that because the, you know, the, the, the damage it does is, is horrific. And, um, Long story short, this the doctor said, um, both these holistic doctors said, there's nothing that we can do. Your cancer um, is, uh, it, you know, it, it, you don't have the luxury of trying a holistic approach. Like it's going to kill you in one to three weeks. They're not lying. So I started chemo the next day and I went through the you know most difficult time in my life. Um, and uh, the, the, the thing, so two things, you, you talked about the income and that's an important piece because we're talking about the business. Um, I didn't have to worry about money at all. In fact, the Miracle Morning sold more copies that year, and I earned more income that year than any year in my life um, without me doing a single interview because the momentum of the book and the word of mouth buzz that it had, that was it, right? And so um, I can't, you know, I, I've done podcasts on how important it is to create multiple streams of income, multiple sources of income. And I mean, I could, you know, we don't have time for us to go on a rant on that, but I could go on a rant on how important I believe that is. And it's not that you need to try to create five streams of income this year, but I really believe that if that you should create, a, if you only have one, create a second one. If you got two, create a third one, right? Um, and uh, for me, every book in the Miracle Morning series is a stream of income, right? It's kind of like real estate's a very popular way of creating passive income, right? For me, it's like every book in the series is a rental property that brings in anywhere from you know a few hundred dollars a month to a thousand or a few thousand a month. Um, and then the original, of course, brings in a lot more. Um, but, uh, but with the economy, you know, and I mean, we've seen even if, you know, industries can hurt that you weren't expecting, or even if you have a job that you've been there for 15 years, and you're senior, you know, at the or executive at the company, right, companies can go, I mean, anything can happen. And I feel like to put all of our financial eggs in one basket is in some ways, and I don't mean this as an insult, but it's, 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 there's some level of irresponsibility of like, just not really think, and, and it's, it's unaware, not like anybody's like, I'm irresponsible, but it's like, I just feel like for our family and our financial security and abundance, having multiple streams of income that you can lean into one, if one goes away or one, you know, diminishes, um, having options, I think is really, really important. Yeah. So important. Um, and I think that's, that's the message that I wanted to help tell uh, you know, through your story is like, you worked your ass off. First of all, you have these ideas, you take action, you build momentum, 
you you keep believing in yourself uh other people are believing in you you ha you're gaining momentum um you're you keep finding out how do i leverage how do i ratchet you know and it's just step by step you know step yeah. by step discipline work um and then at this point in your life thank goodness that you have that momentum so that you can take care of yourself and your family during this time because you just never know when or what curveball is going to be thrown your way. But likely yeah. everybody will have some type of curveball. Sure. And and it was awesome that you were in a position to be able to take the time off and have the finances to be able to do that. And now <clears throat> one of the things I also want to talk about how is saying no. Mm. Cuz part of mm. what has allowed you to become a family man with a business, not a businessman with a family, which you were in the beginning, I was in the beginning. <clears throat> is your ability to say no. Talk to me about that for a minute. And I also want to mention that I'm, I don't know what you have going on on your calendar, but I, I want to just be acknowledging. I have time. 15 more. I have something 15 minutes. How you doing? Okay. Yeah. Talk to okay. me about, let's take, let's take 10 of it then seven yeah. of it. If well, yeah. we can start to land the plane, but <clears throat> yeah. How do you, how do you create boundaries for yourself now? So um, I'll answer that on a personal and a professional level. Um, I think they're different. And I think, uh, you know, I'm not the best at saying no. In fact, I'm a, I mean, you can just, just by the bait, what we talked about, like, I just say yes. And then I figure it out. So sometimes I'll say yes. And then I'll, Ursula will be like, dude, that's during the kids Thanksgiving break. What do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm definitely not perfect to that. But a um, couple of things. Uh, one is the, with the miracle morning, I realized that's my life's work. Um, I didn't know that in the beginning. So when the Miracle Morning launched, that's why my podcast is called Achieve Your Goals with Hal Elrod. And the live event that I put on was called The Best Year Ever Blueprint. Uh, and the mastermind was called the Quantum Leap Mastermind. I launched all of these things uh, at the, you know, kind of within a few months of each other. Um, and uh, I didn't know Miracle Morning was going to become this global brand, right? So I was throwing a lot of different things at the wall. Um, like if I did now, it'd probably be the Miracle Morning event and the Miracle Morning Mastermind and the Miracle Morning Podcast, right? Um, and uh, and so, and I have done some rebranding around like, um, or like we don't do live events right now. So if I do another one, when I, if I ever go back to live events, it will definitely be a Miracle Morning, you know, live event and the Miracle Morning Mastermind, so on and so forth. We just launched the Miracle Morning app, um, Miracle Morning movie. So in terms of professionally, what I realize is that, my mission is to get the miracle morning in front of as many people as possible in the hands of as many people as possible, because nothing I've ever created has ever impacted people's lives as much as the miracle morning. Um, so my keynote speech is the miracle morning, right? The app is the miracle morning, the movies, the miracle morning, the series, of the miracle morning. And so it became easy to say no to anything, even if there was money involved and I would get paid that wasn't aligned with furthering the miracle morning mission, right? That was it. Um, and, uh, and the other piece of that is, kind of the other side of the coin is I've had a lot of authors that have seen me give this one keynote I give called Beyond the Best Seller, how to write a book that creates a movement, earns you a fortune and changes the world. And every time I give that, I show the graph. I have the graph of my book sales of those 18 months where I was working my butt off and wasn't selling much books and wasn't making much money, but I believed in the message and the book and the mission. So I just kept going. And then you see the hockey stick a year and a half later when it, when it goes up. And I've had so many authors say, man, I promoted my book for a month or three months. And then I shifted gears and got distracted and did something. I chased the next score. I did something else. They go, if I had done what you did and kept promoting my book for now, it's been 11 years. I still do Miracle Morning interviews. And we have a new edition of the book, of course, the updated and expanded edition, which y'all can pre-order today at thenewmiraclemorning.com. Um, and this has 70 pages of new bonus content. It's a really, really awesome, really uh, updated book. But um, so again, in alignment with the mission, but uh, oh, where was I going with that? Miracle morning mission, all the things saying no to the other things. Oh, but that these was authors, ultimately, yeah, they said if, yep. if I had kept promoting my book, I wonder where it would be. Like I believed in it. It helped people, but I shifted gears because it wasn't selling as fast as I wanted or, you know what I mean? Um, and so, uh, I think that there's a couple of lessons in that is one, you know, you got to try different things, right. And then you have to really pay attention to the feedback from the people that you are selling to or marketing to, or giving it to, right? Like in the beginning, my coaching clients are the reason I wrote the miracle morning 
because it helped them. It changed their life, right? Then when the Miracle Morning people started sharing that it was changing their life, I committed to sell a million copies no matter how long it took. Then when that happened, I was like, okay, now I'm going to just spend the rest of my life sharing the Miracle Morning and so on and so forth. Um, and the beauty of it is, is even if I never shared it again, the book is on autopilot. People read it, they share it, so on and so forth. Um, so saying no to anything that wasn't alignment with my mission. Um, and then in terms of my kids, you know, our friend Pat Flynn, uh, who I, interestingly enough, is also the person that, you know, his, uh, his podcast was the, a real launching pad for the Miracle Morning. But he said that um, if, 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 uh, if an opportunity is going to take me away from my kids, it's an easy no. And uh, for a while, I was saying no to everything that took me away from my kids because of that. But then I realized I love speaking. And it's what I do best. And I talk to my wife and she's like, no, go speak a few times a month. Like me and the kids are fine. Like, you know, they don't forget who you are. Um, I think when they were little, it was more of a concern. And now they're, you know, they're 11 and 14. Um, and so I, now I speak, you know, a few times a month. I love it. It's a nice break from the family. It's a nice, gives me some space, you know, to a, a, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Right. So, so it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. No. Um, but I say no to things that aren't in alignment with the miracle morning. Um, and I say no to things that, uh, you know, that for the most part, like I don't work on the weekends. I, you know, I, I say no to most things that take me away from the kids. Yeah. One thing you do say no too well is staying up late. <laughs> <laughs> that is Dude, true, but that's not I, for the kids. That is for me. That I have, for, yeah. I have so many stories of like being, <laughs> you know, ever being in Vegas with you and, Dude, uh, you would be like, nope, it's nine o'clock. I'm out of here. Uh, and I'm like, but it's Vegas. <laughs> You're out. You're like, dude, the uh, miracle morning in Vegas. Sounds when we amazing. would share a room or something. You would be like up early and you'd be in the bathroom. Yeah. You know, yeah. with you know, closing the door, doing the doing your miracle morning routine. Hysterical, dude. But <laughs> it's it's something that, you know, we we all kind of joked you about over the years that you would be the first one to leave a party. You'd be the first one out of there. And at the same time, it was a commitment to the discipline of what you knew would energize you. You just, what was cool about it was that you didn't, you weren't, you, you didn't give in to any type of peer pressure. I mean, maybe from time to time for the right UFC fight, yeah. but, uh, but, but ultimately I think what was, what we all loved about that was you had integrity to yourself. You knew um, you, you just knew what was right for you. You knew how the next day was going to go when you got up early. And, um, I think it's safe to say that also, you know, you, one of the evolutions was your attention to yourself first, even beyond the mission. Like if how wasn't okay, then it's hard to keep talking about the miracle morning, right? So your health, your discipline with your time off your space, you took a sabbatical for six months that you were able to fund, that you were able to just say no to opportunity. And you have people constantly coming at you with new opportunities for your yeah. business. Hey, if we yeah. just do this, you can make a couple more million. Yeah. But you've said no to the, a lot of those opportunities so that you can, um, and you know, and and I, I won't reveal anything uh, that you don't want to be revealed because you said it in confidence at our at our small, you know, our, our band meetup for anybody who knows the front row dad lingo, like our small group. But you were talking about some counsel that you recently got that was ultimately about what to say no to. And that was in some ways, some business people, some consultants, some coaches, some individuals might have looked at that counsel that you got and said, oh, but you might be playing small or you might be leaving money on the table or if you just did this. Yeah. But what what I my kind of final comment to the audience and to you, Hal, is the journey of how coming alive back, you know, years and years ago, finding a way to put food on the table, finding a way to increase the value that you saw in yourself, the value you were bringing to the world. You learned how to pull these different levers. You learned how to serve more people with less effort on your part. You learned how to involve other people and these partnerships along the way that built. You kept course correcting. You kept picking yourself up when you would fall. You kept moving forward in this, this you know, in the face of facing, you know, in, in facing cancer, getting to the lowest point possibly physically of your life, 
the discipline that you had with the food that you ate, how you took care of yourself, the affirmations, the visualization, all of it I know worked in conjunction to save your life. And then here you are now living this incredible life where I'm still talking to a guy who's like, I'm more in love with my wife than ever before. Last year at Front Row Dad Live, you taught the forever pledge. I see your relationship with your kids growing. I see you jumping on the trampoline. I see you like, it's awesome. It's awesome, man. It's a whole journey. It's a whole lifetime of experiences and decisions. And that's what I just wanted to take a minute and, and state for the audience and reflect to you that I'm so excited for you. Uh, I, I, it's been a joy to watch the journey and I'm pumped about whatever podcast we do 20 years from now about what happens through the forties and fifties in our life and possibly, you know, into like, what do we create next? What type of family adventures, who do our kids become when they grow up and move out of the house and then yeah. grandkids and then the other dads that we get to help, right? All of it. Um, so thank you, buddy. And thank you to everybody for listening today. I hope you get the new copy of the book that's out. It's beautiful. It's well done, man. The app is killer. And for anybody who wants to come hang in person with Hal and I, yes. uh, December 6th through the 8th in Austin, Texas, we're going to be, we're going to be there. So frontroadads.com slash live is the website. And I'm pumped, man. I'm really pumped. I'm excited for this, man. I, uh, and you and Brian Johnson is going to be speaking, who is the author of, I literally texted him the other day. I'm like, dude, your new book may be, I'm like, I'm still too early to say, but it may be my favorite book of all time. And you uh, may be, you're definitely one of my favorite authors, but you are quickly becoming my favorite author. Yeah. Yeah. There's the one, two punch right there. Uh, yeah. And mine is a third of the length of his. So read mine first <laughs> and then implement your Build new momentum. miracle morning. And then you'll have space. Read his book actually. in the miracle morning after you get implement the routine. <laughs> That's right, dude. dude awesome, so great I love you, man. Thank you. And thanks for all, all that beautiful reflection you just gave. Yeah, man. Well, I'll see you soon. Thanks, brother. And uh, to all you men out there. Um, hey, this is what I keep saying about the event. Day one is about you, the man, right? Making sure that you are physically and emotionally ready to serve your family, get your mind right on day one. Day two is about how do you show up as a dad? How are you, pre how do you, be, how to be present with your kids, how to connect with them, how to have an incredible relationship with your wife, whether it's already amazing and you want to keep going further and deeper and expanding your relationship or whether you're on the brink of divorce and you're looking for tools to save your marriage. And then finally, day three is going to be about the work. It's about your business. It's about your mission. It's about making money so that you can fund these experiences. You can take care of your family and you can weather the storms when they come, regardless of what's coming. If it's a health challenge or if it's an economic challenge or whatever it is. And, uh, and don't do all that alone because the other part of it is do those three things, but do that with a group of men because community is the greatest survival tool. Community is the greatest survival tool. So get around some brothers that got your back. Love you, Hal. Guys, go Love get the book, The Miracle Morning, the app. It's out there. Make it happen.